um, I will give a more uh, research heavy uh, talk maybe uh, compared to uh, some of the previous ones. Uh, so, you know, don't worry if some parts of this will, will go, you know, too deep for, uh, for you. But what I really want you all to get away from this talk is that you don't have to necessarily choose in your career between industry and research. You can be doing research in industry as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about how I got there and uh, what it is that I'm working on these days. Um, so first of all, um, again, my name is Michaela Paganini. I am a research scientist in artificial intelligence uh, here in London, working at DeepMind. Um, and I currently work in pure artificial intelligent research, uh, but my background is entirely in high energy physics. So up until just maybe like two, three years ago, I was probably right there where you are doing my PhD, uh, again, in my case in uh, uh, experimental HEP. Um, and it was part of the Atlas collaboration at CERN. Um, but my career trajectory took me from, you know, the, the very first summer uh, of my PhD where I first learned about machine learning, about deep learning. Um, and ever since then, I started working at this really cool intersection between the sciences uh, and machine learning. So I like to say that in a way, at first I was working in one direction, so one side of the metal, which is focusing on machine learning for physics, and then more recently um, working in AI using my skills that I acquired hopefully throughout the years of my PhD um, to contribute to research in artificial intelligence and help develop um, a more fundamental understanding um, of the inner workings of neural networks. Um, and again, tomorrow we'll have the dedicated panel, so I'll be more than happy to answer any questions about um, my transition and how I ended up, you know, publishing, uh, ended up from publishing uh, things about jets and quarks and uh, electromagnetic showers uh, to doing the type of uh, research in fundamental AI that I'll tell you more about today. Um, so the uh, topic of today's talk is sparsity in neural networks, um, which is really what I've been working on uh, in a way or another for the past three years or so. Uh, and I would say, I mean, I'm a bit biased, but I think this is a really hot topic. Uh, in artificial intelligence research these days. Um, incredible number of publications being put out there, not just recently, but as you'll see, like, you know, for the past few decades even. Um, and so the, the agenda is very simple. Uh, why, what, and how of sparsity, and in particular pruning. Um, I also left you some supplementary material um, that you will find attached to Indico already. There's plenty of great material out there in this topic here. Um, I pointed you to this great workshop that uh, some of my collaborators organized very recently. You'll find all of the contributed talks at sparseneural.net, as well as on uh, YouTube. You'll, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Uh, if not, once you get access to these slides, there's actually a link there. Um, and then another great resource that I've been using also to prepare the slides uh, is this incredible uh, review paper, 90 pages and more, uh, on the topic of sparsity and deep learning. Um, so let's start with a very brief intro, uh, and hopefully that will help you understand the why from both a practical standpoint uh, and a theoretical standpoint. Um, so many of you probably know uh, that these days, these state-of-the-art models uh, in AI research, especially in fields like natural language process processing, um, are based on extremely deep neural networks. And these extremely deep neural networks, surprisingly to some extent, have been able to, to learn and to converge uh, in some way, in a way or another, um, without really running into those insurmountable difficulties that we, we thought we would encounter once scaling to that level of, of depth in, in these neural networks. Um, and in fact, these neural networks have been massively growing in size uh, over the past decade or so. We've seen models entering like comfortably like the hundreds of billions of parameters, like in the trillions of parameters these days even. Um, and so we know that over parameterization, so adding so many parameters, doesn't actually hinder learning as we traditionally believed, um, but it might actually improve the trainability and the generalization of these models. And there are plenty of theoretical and empirical results um, providing evidence for this statement. Um, but there's also evidence uh, that even in these overparameterized models, not all of the nodes are utilized uniformly. And so if you look at some um, information theoretical aspects of, of gradient descent, of optimization, for example, 
um, it looks like there would be two phases, one that is more chaotic, like a phase of fast learning in the first phase. And then there is sort of a diffusion phase, as it's called, um, where what the network might be performing is a representation compression. So that might happen automatically under the dynamics of stochastic gradient descent. Um, and people have looked into all sorts of different measures, like the spectrum of the Hessian. Uh, they looked at what they call intrinsic dimensions and random embeddings, adaptive learning rates, and so on. And so the evidence that has emerged is that SGD, uh, so optimization, might really just happen in a very small subspace of um, the weight space. And so um, compression in practice tries to identify the subspace and to try to constrain us to, to really this lower dimensional um, space, not just at inference time, but also potentially a training time to try to save some flops. And so there is definitely a big push on the theoretical front to uh, better understand all these arguments and all these phenomena that we've observed. Uh, but then on the practical side, of course, like there is this push, as we said, towards bigger and bigger models, more and more powerful models. Um, but there are also competing needs if you think about deployment, energy efficiency, and so on. And so um, the community is also pushed simultaneously towards uh, focusing on the other scaling frontier, which is the frontier of efficient AI. So scaling down to then be able to scale up uh, more efficiently and, and sustainably. Um, so when we look at very large models, it could be like language models, for example, you know, we don't necessarily all have uh, the luxury to use all these compute cycles to continue retraining billions, hundreds of billions of parameters, potentially some of them even being redundant and so on. And then once we deploy them, what's the latency? Like how, how quickly can you sample the next word or whatever it is that you're generating? Um, and so in practice, uh, practitioners have been focusing on model compression techniques and that could be pruning, quantization, distillations and other ones that we'll talk about later. Um, and we have collectively like empirically demonstrated that oftentimes training a huge model and then compressing it down um, can give us better results in trying to train a small model from the get-go. And so, um, yeah, so just make the example of, of language models um, very vaguely, but uh, really why are we compressing models? I think like to me, the number one reason is sustainability. Um, but of course there will be other compelling points that, that I'll make in the next slide. Um, but I think we need to think about AI as becoming a ubiquitous technology in the future. So we also need to have a global perspective uh, in mind and, and think about resource constraints, environments and scenarios. Um, so I think as to just complete this discussion on the why, um, I think it's intuitive enough to understand why we would want to move away from networks with hundreds of billions of parameters if we can. Uh, but of course, there are some advantages and disadvantages from um, related to training and having smaller models. Um, so the advantages, first of all, to begin with, like obviously we have uh, storage concerns, so it could be important uh, to, um, to save spaces save space um, with smaller models uh, and then compressed models can also run on the edge. So in science, that can mean, for example, having uh, custom hardware close to a detector as CERN, for example. Um, but in the outside world and, and technology, that can mean um, running and deploying models privately on device, uh, on mobile or um, VR goggles like Oculus or IoT systems. Um, and this can Again, address some of the privacy issues um, related to, to deploying models to users. Uh, there is a power and energy consumption arguments to be made as well. So of course, if we can reduce the energy consumption, that could increase the battery life of a device um, and it could allow for computation on low power devices, um, reduce heat dissipation, for example, which is important for wearables. Um, and then we can say that inference and training could potentially be sped up. Uh, this, of course, comes with a, should come with a big asterisk, which is depending on the type of compression method that you utilize and the type of hardware that you'll run your model on. So um, it may or may not uh, be realized, but there is certainly a promise for faster inference and faster training. Uh, monetary costs associated with training big models, of course, has, has created barriers and disparities among groups. Um, and I think like students, unfortunately, uh, are the ones that pay the heftiest price here because, uh, yeah, these these disparities may 
um, block access to opportunities and based on the institute the students come from. And I don't think that's that's a fair way of organizing science. Um, and then I think most interesting to me, um, compressing models can really give us ways to understand what parts of the network are responsible for what bits of information processing and learning. And so really go to challenge our notions of trainability, uh, um, of dynamics of learning and, and this like science of deep learning uh, sort of um, discourse. And so these are some of the advantages and then just briefly the disadvantages. Um, I mean, we do have like the entire hubs of pre-trained dense models. We might not necessarily have widely available standards pre-trained compressed models to start with. So if you have to then train from scratch, you know, um, you might end up spending even more time and resources. So that, that could be one drawback. Um, and then one concern that I feel very strongly about is the fact that um, oftentimes in uh, sparsity research, the performance drop upon sparsification is oftentimes quantified in terms of overall accuracy drop as opposed to um, paying attention to uh, the adverse impact that this engineering decision might have on specific classes or specific users or outliers um, or ability or inability to capture the tails of the distribution, for example. Um, and then as I quickly mentioned earlier, uh, we need to remember that we're working on the hardware that we have. So modern hardware and the access patterns and so on and accelerators, they have all been designed for the most part, except for a few uh, targeted topologies, um, for dense computation, so without compression in mind. Um, and so we're going to need new custom kernels, new custom hardware, potentially linear algebra uh, libraries to really take advantage of the promise um, that sparsity um, has, has made. Okay, so we talked about the why, uh, and I hope that was exhaustive enough. Um, now let's talk a little bit more about the what and, and let's try to get some more details on what sparsity actually is. Um, and if you think you've never used sparsity before in a neural network, I think you might be wrong, because if you've ever trained a convolutional neural network, and this might be some of you in the audience, um, or even locally connected layers, well, those, of course, like besides introducing those useful inductive biases that we know and love, um, such as translational invariance and so on, um, they can also be seen, as you can hopefully see in this representation here, um, as efficiently sparsified linear uh, layers or dense layer, in fact, as they're called when they're densely connected. Um, and so uh, it's obvious here also that this type of sparsity and convolutional layers has a specific structure. Um, and uh, there is weight sharing on top of that for, for further compression. But you know, this is just one example of sparsity that you might have inadvertently used without even realizing it. Um, but uh, so I mentioned a few types of uh, compression techniques. So let me try to enumerate a few more of them explicitly. Um, and I'd like to divide this space into constructive approaches to uh, efficient model design and destructive approaches. Uh, that's at least like my mental model to some extent. Um, so constructive approaches, they usually try to um, build an efficient architecture from the ground up by um, carefully positioning and adding parameters and operations uh, in very clever ways, either through human design, um, so to explicitly, once again, add our inductive biases or um, any type of transformation or invariance into the network, um, so you know, human design or automatically. So this could be neural architecture search, auto ML type of techniques. Um, and I think like I like to group all sorts of different things in here from you know basic concepts like weight sharing and CNNs like we just mentioned, all the way to the development of highway networks, squeeze nets, res nets, gatings, uh, conditional computation, um, even these like randomly wired neural networks that have recently become quite popular. And so it's a big bucket, but I won't go too much into it. Um, and then there are some of the destructive approaches that I've been personally focusing on a little bit more. Um, and some of these might include uh, distillation from a teacher network down to a smaller student network, uh, quantization of the weights uh, in your tensors, um, tensor factorization techniques, and then finally pruning, which is what we'll focus on uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, so what is pruning? Uh, the way I like to put it very simply is that it just means removing unnecessary stuff uh, from a network to try to reduce it down in size. 
And of course, that's a very, very vague <laughs> way of describing it. What sort of stuff are we talking about? What structure? Are we removing neurons or are we just like removing some of the connections among these neurons? Um, and how do you define superfluous? How do you define unnecessary? Um, how, yeah, how do you do that if you don't really have a strong, solid theory of what's going on inside of these networks? Um, but thankfully, pruning has been studied extensively over time, starting from, um, from the compression techniques in the literature around uh, decision trees, if you're familiar with that type of machine learning models. Um, but also in the early days of neural networks, um, so going back to the optimal brain damage paper by Jan LeCun and uh, some of his collaborators, um, where he introduced second order methods, we might mention them briefly again later, um, to perform optimal pruning, but there is also the optimal brain surgeon paper that came after that. Um, and a lot of these were primarily concerned with generalization, interpretability, and, and a lot more. Okay, so we've seen the why, the what very briefly, the how. This is uh, quite extensive. There are so many different techniques. Um, so obviously over the years, researchers have developed all sorts of different ways of trying to identify the superfluous portions of the model, as we just, uh, as we just said. Um, and this has resulted, of course, in the creation of all sorts of different pruning techniques. Um, and these may vary along a lot of different axes. I'll just mention a few of them here, but this is definitely not going to be exhaustive. Um, so of course, uh, what the entity of what is being pruned, this could be connections, nodes, channels, layers, gradients, activations, all sorts of things. Um, and then the choice of the proxy for importance. So what is important, what is unimportant? Um, and then this could be based on the weight again, on the activation, on the gradient, and all sorts of different measures. Um, the group of entities to try to pull together for comparison. So are, are we talking about all the units in the same layer or all the units across the whole network? Uh, the structure of the sparsity, when to prune during, before, and after training. Um, whether the prune entities, for example, are forever pruned or whether they can be reinstated, whether uh, we're applying like hard subbinary masking or some sort of soft pruning, uh, iterative versus one shot, and then what to do with the network once it's been pruned. So fine tuning it, reinitializing it, and rewinding it. So there's a big laundry list. So let me try to help you visualize it a little bit. Um, so let's start with the basic process itself. So normally, uh, when we are in the business of building our lovely neural network from scratch, first thing that we do is we initialize it and then we train it according to some procedure, right? Then we want to add pruning into the process. So most techniques historically, most pruning techniques, um, have acted on trained networks or partially pre-trained networks, so after the training phase. However, another thing that one can do um, uh, afterwards is to extend this loop um, so instead of simply continuing training the net after pruning, uh, as, um, as we do, for example, in the fine tuning examples, um, one can decide to, um, to rewind the weights um, uh, to their initial values or to some earlier values and then retrain from there and then maybe prune again and then reinitialize, retrain, reprune, and so on in this like iterative fashion. And if you've heard about the lottery ticket hypothesis, and if you haven't, that's okay. But if you have heard of it, this is sort of what that paper advocated doing. Um, and then just as an aside, something else that I want to mention is that um, there are methods in which, of course, pruning happens at initialization, so before any training even happens. And this can be done, once again, in a one-shot way, so prune all at once, or some form of iterative way before the network uh, is then trained uh, in an already compressed uh, format. So the schedule is very important. And this is another slide, another way to visualize what I just said. Hopefully this can be a little bit more intuitive. And this is from a paper, from that review paper that I linked to, uh, to originally um, by Hoefler and others. Um, and here you see uh, the number of remaining weights on the y-axis is a function of the training iterations for three different types of schedules. And so some people just train a fully dense model and then they prune it all at the end in one shot and maybe they fine tune it for a little bit. Um, others prefer to iteratively reduce the number of parameters as they train. And then finally, others start sparse and remain sparse maybe by dropping and regrowing some of the connections in, in an equal proportion um, but they remain at the same uh, level of sparsity. 
Um, and the main difference here is that if you have limited memory, uh, if you have a limited budget, um, this last method is the only one, as you can see on the y-axis, that allows you to remain under a certain threshold um, and uh, avoid starting from a much larger network to then just reduce down to the size that you're actually targeting. So if you're interested in this type of methods, uh, there is a great paper called Rigging the Lottery uh, or Riggle uh, that gives you that sort of dynamism uh, that allows you to um, both learn the weights and modify the connectivity structure um, while remaining at a constant total sparsity, um, so without limiting yourself to the structure that you end up sampling or finding an in initialization, but allowing you to, to modify that uh, throughout training. Um, and then, of course, like we talked about how pruning can be inserted in the training uh, loop. Of course, it can also be uh, inserted um, through some sort of regularization, so imposing uh, sparsity through regularization schemes, for example. Um, so a typical thing that one would do is to penalize um, weights from growing too far away from zero. Um, so making the value of zero particularly advantageous. And there are uh, typical examples of, of uh, some of these regularization techniques on the slides. Um, so we have L2 and L1 norms that you might be familiar with already. Um, but even the L0 norm that would be really ideal for us here because ideally you wouldn't want to interfere too much with the rest of the trainings, the learning dynamics of the model. Um, and so you wouldn't want to prevent weights from growing really large if that's what they need to do. Um, so the L0 norm is really what we would want to do, but unfortunately is not differentiable. Uh, so it's not super easy to use right up, you know, just out of the box, but there are of course workarounds um, like the paper um, where I got this, this plot from uh, that introduces some differentiable gatings or you can use approximations of the L0 norm to, uh, to make them use, useful and usable. Um, so uh, I, I guess like the piece of conventional wisdom here is that yes, we use regularization all the time, but especially if your goal is to then identify um, uh, weights that are unimportant by looking at their magnitude. If you're also penalizing the magnitude from growing, then you're interfering with the dynamics in some uh, interesting ways. So I would say like, you know, be careful um, interacting with the learning directly unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, and then forms of stochastic regularization, unlike the ones that we just talked about, uh, include the dropout family. This is, once again, if you are a deep learning practitioner, you probably have heard of this. If not, uh, the, the super quick uh, explanation of this is that um, in traditional dropout, what we do is that we have ephemeral uh, sparsity throughout the network. So um, what, you, what you do is you start out with a dense network and your goal is to end up with a dense network. So all you're doing is you're stochastically dropping connections like that uh, throughout the training. So you're sampling, like in this case, say two connections at random and you're dropping them throughout the training. But then during the inference mode, you will definitely have all of them uh, in, your, in your network. So this is not supposed to induce sparsity in the final, um, in the final network. Uh, variational dropout instead is a whole other beast with very different effects and um, we can see it as a form um, of, of dropout because dropout is really just adding some local noise to the activations of the network um, and in particular regular dropout can be seen as adding this like Bernoulli uh, type of noise but that can be generalized to any sort of noise in particular Gaussian or really any other kind um, and this has both regularization effects but with the right type of noise, we can get um, networks to have such high variance uh, across certain um, certain weights, so certain connections, that those connections become completely useless to some extent. And so they will tend to have weights go to zero because they're really uninformative. And so variational dropout can actually induce sparsity in the final uh, model. Um, Okay, so now we've talked about all these fancy schedules and in-training methods to, to try to induce sparsity. Let's go back to the simpler case where all that we're doing is just printing connections by hand. We decide what the heuristic is and uh, we do so maybe as we're training uh, the network. So how do we select which nodes to just set to zero and maybe keep at zero for, for the rest of the training? Um, so this is really important because the way you end up selecting what to send to zero will give rise to different sub-networks, which will have different characteristics, as you can imagine. 
Um, and so the selection could be based on anything, really any fancy or non-fancy function of the weights of the activations or the gradients or maybe uh, some interpretability measure or anything. So what you're seeing here is from a paper uh, from Uber AI, uh, for example, and what they do is they experiment with uh, different functions of the weight magnitudes. So they just take very simple functions of the weight um, uh, at initialization or at the point in time where, um, where they are making the pruning. Um, and in general, I want to stress this, the most popular technique uh, really just consists of like looking at the absolute value of the magnitude of the weights and removing the small ones. They're almost zero anyway, it's just set them to zero. That's what like works really well. Um, you could of course consider all sorts of other things like fancy first or second order uh, approximations of the loss. So the sensitivity of the loss to the change in the parameter or again, the variance um, of that parameter across the data set. So it could be data independent or data driven techniques. Um, and then literally any heuristic you can think about, it's probably uh, been explored here. Um, and so I just wanted to reiterate, reiterate the point that um, oftentimes people ask like, okay, well, which, which one of these, you know, thousands of printing techniques should I use? Um, and I think if you are a practitioner, the very first thing you should always try, as I said before, is this very simple magnitude based pruning. Take the magnitude absolute value, remove the smallest one, set them to zero. Um, and so uh, this is really like, you know, this works really well in the end, much better than uh, some of the fancier, more compute intensive techniques. And what you can see in this plot here is that um, as we, so we measured the test accuracy as a function of the epochs of training. And at some epochs we prune. Uh, and so you can see the percentage uh, sparsity that is achieved at each pruning. Uh, step and what you can see is that uh, magnitude based pruning like upon pruning actually drops in performance quite significantly compared to some of the fancier, for example, second order methods. But then as we continue training or as we fine tune, the gap is almost always closed. So you might as well use the simpler um, uh, the simpler technique. Obviously, this plot doesn't explore very, very high extreme sparsity. So, you know, um, there is always uh, some some degree of complexity that is um, uh, that, that comes up at that point. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say this will always work best, but this is always a very sensible baseline that you should always try first before you move on to anything fancier. OK, so let's continue with the how. Um, so as we said before, another very important decision um, along um, like that spectrum that I told you about uh, is whether we want to prune entire neurons or entire channels if we're talking about um, convolutional errors, for example. So these are called usually structured pruning techniques to create those visible structure or if you want to prune individual connections, um, and these are usually called unstructured pruning techniques. So here, hopefully you get this, like, uh, besides the algorithms, maybe, but don't, don't worry about those, like, get the visual uh, meaning of this. Uh, so we have on the left, again, the structured um, sparsity, which uh, only leaves, like, a few channels in this, uh, you know, convolutional layer active, and on the right side, same exact um, layer, but pruned with uh, unstructured pruning only leaves a few of these connections within these filters uh, available to you. And there are, of course, trade-offs. Uh, so we know that unstructured pruning might work best if all you're looking at is the total test accuracy. But then remember, we, we have to worry about how do we accelerate the sparsity? Um, how does this look on hardware once you uh, have to like, you know, go fetch data? Um, can this actually be accelerated? And so, uh, it's really important in my mind to, to remember that test accuracy is not the only quantity of interest uh, when we sparsify, um, because ultimately, what do we sparsify for? We sparsify it because we wanted to reduce compute. Uh, and so not all sparsity patterns and not all representations of, um, of sparsity are equally amenable to uh, acceleration on current generally aware hardware architectures. So, um, for example, as I said, on structure pruning, as competitive as it might be from the total test accuracy standpoint, um, it is quite often like hard to exploit computationally um, compared to more structured forms of sparsity that you can see, for example, up here in the top. 
Um, and that, again, primarily has to do with how the data is stored and then moved around uh, in our computing system, which is something that we oftentimes forget about. Um, and that honestly, I didn't even know too much about um, until you know later on during my PhD. So I wasn't even trained as a physicist to really think about data this way um, until it became obvious that it was important. Um, and so to that end, people have started um, developing um, hardware-oriented um, compression techniques. Uh, so they might include some form of like load balancing, um, so load balance aware pruning, uh, locality uh, aware pruning to try to reduce the data movement uh, across the device and try to reduce like very expensive lookups. Um, and then um, on, the other, on the other hand, something else that I can think about is like when you have like these like ultra low latency applications and you might have like a batch size of one, you just have to like run inference for sampling like very, very quickly. Um, then having like a sparse matrix vector multiplication um, uh, allows you to really uh, take advantage of sparsity of any uh, of any shape to really speed up the computation because you have like again these matrices and vectors that have zeros in certain locations and you can really take advantage of like not having to do that computation but once you start having um, dense matrix sparse matrix sort of multiplications then it becomes a little bit more complicated because if you have those like tensor core type of architectures that just like to multiply big batches uh, of things together. And it's a lot harder than to, to exploit sparsity unless it's structured in particular ways. So now we've talked about the why, the what, and the how to some extent. Um, I try to be as concise as possible, even though as you've probably understood, this is an enormous space. Um, so what's next? Um, so in my mind, uh, there it just isn't any way in which the future won't bring us closer to AI just being ubiquitous, being everywhere and needing to be more efficient, uh, more private, more responsible. Um, and this is true in industry as well as in science. Uh, so I think this will be relevant as well as uh, at places like CERN, which is where I come from, uh, academically speaking. Um, so I think compression uh, to me will always be top of mind for both researchers and practitioners. It's an extremely exciting topic. It's extremely impactful. Um, so I think the research in this area is, is very compelling. Um, and as it's clear, there's still a lot to be done in this domain. Uh, and I think it's, it's, again, this is why it's a very exciting research avenue uh, in the field of efficient AI. So I think in the immediate future, um, people want to uh, look at ways in which we can more automatically identify promising subnetworks within a, a more densely connected network uh, that are capable of learning. So both during training and, and then inference uh, in, uh, in much more efficient ways and, and, and be successful without having to rely on over parameterization, which is what we've been doing really in the field up until this point. Um, and then personally, uh, I think I'm, I'm very keen on really trying to deliver on more tangible improvements for the community when it comes to uh, leveraging sparsity and compression. So really making the most out of the hardware um, without wasting unnecessary cycles and multiplying zeros all over the place. Um, and this is very complicated, again, because it requires collaboration and understanding uh, between experts on the um, on the hardware side and experts on the machine learning side or, or uh, software side of things in general. So we have this uh, software hardware co-design, which I think is an, a, an incredibly interesting frontier and it's going to become more and more important. And then if you are more inclined instead to uh, think about product applications, of course, like uh, everything that is coming up with like uh, private machine learning, so privacy preserving machine learning interpretability, as well as like augmented reality, virtual reality, um, wearables in general. I think uh, all of these like will will have a lot to learn from the research that will be coming up in the in the next few years uh, on the front uh, of uh, of sparsity. Um, so I hope that this was intriguing enough for you, even though I know it was quite dense with notions and, uh, and definitions. Um, so I am obviously working in the space uh, alongside some of my colleagues at DeepMind.
Uh, if this is something that you think you might be interested in exploring, your timing couldn't be better because uh, we will be opening up the call for applications for research internships uh, for 2022 tomorrow. So I link to uh, the careers website here, deepmind.com slash career slash internships. So from tomorrow, you should see the application going live there. So please apply um, and maybe you'll get a chance to work with all of us. Uh, other than that, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I think we should have some time. Thank you very much, Michaela. That was very interesting. So since we've run over a bit of time in the other talk, uh, let's have you say a few quick questions. Just raise your hand on saying if you want to ask a question, please. I will ask the first one. I mean, while people think think about what they. So I had a question regarding Bayesian neural networks, since uh, we've been hearing about them quite a bit this week, and it looks like it goes in the opposite direction to sparsity, right? Where you might have even several models, if the same model repeated with different weights, right? So I was wondering whether you've done anything in in that direction. So you said Bayesian. Uh, yes, but by, by using neural networks, right? When you have, um, you want to have the distribution over weights and things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, so things, for example, like the variational dropout that I mentioned certainly fits well within like the Bayesian literature. It's 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 absolutely 100% like a variational method in the true sense. Um, uh, so yes, there are many ways in which these two fields uh, interact with each other. Um, again, yeah, you can see neural networks instead of like having uh, point values sort of weights having distributions over weights, and then you can impose whatever prior you want on those distributions, whether it's a sparsity inducing one or not. I personally have to say I've never really worked in the Bayesian uh, world. I'm not, a, not, not at all an expert, but uh, lots of great work out of, for example, Amsterdam um, and a lot of um, those, field, those uh, folks out there. So uh, yes, definitely stay tuned for, for more connections in that space. Thanks. Any other questions for Michaela? Otherwise, uh, she'll be there tomorrow for the career panel, so you have the opportunity to ask more questions there. Thank you.